warning, some viewers may find this content disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Once again, you have stopped by the Fox Den for another episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. This is going to be a banger, yet please allow me to attend to something. Much better. I was so hungry and depleted of nutrients. Now that I am fully revamped and ready to roll, it is time for Barb Hartman and I to take a walk into the darkness. My creatures of the night, yes, welcome back to another episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. Again, we have a good friend of mine as well of the North American Dogman Project, Miss Barb Hartman, who has decided to again invest some time with us, and she will be investing more of her time. How are you doing tonight, Barb? I'm doing I'm great. Doing great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. It's always great to have you back on here. How have you been? I'm doing good. Yep. Yep. I have lots of questions for you tonight, so get ready. (laughs) Hey, perfect. Sounds good. Is uh, anything new your way with any of your research? Um, Just a couple of things, but, you know, I had a report that I wanted to share with you um, on my Facebook page about a dog man a guy that had, that was a witness. Do you want to talk about that now or do you want to hold off on that? What do you think? Perfect. Let's roll with that. And then whenever you feel you'd like to fire away some questions, we'll get okay. going with those. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Because actually like taking this, you know, uh, talking to the, this guy about this report, it just uh, like a firm to me, we had talked about this earlier in the week, the commonalities that I'm seeing in, you know, in the witness reports, I don't know a lot about dog man. And I, um, but I, at this point, it's been, I guess, like a, almost a year and a half that I've been interviewing people. And a lot of people are, you know, are witnesses to dog man. So I have this, like I said, commonality showing up, but let's go, I'll tell you about this. So this is a recent report I got, like I said, on my page. Um, and I'm going to kind of, you know, paraphrase it. Anybody can see the, um, the entire version on my, yeah. My yeah. We'll page. get you a no, link up there. Like, always, yeah, yeah, of course. yeah, yeah, sure. So this report came from Dustin and he said that it was the summer of 1998, uh, during powwow season and Dustin and seven of his friends were in a van and they were traveling in Wisconsin, headed to the red cliff powwow. It was about 8 30 PM and they had been driving for about an hour and a half. Um, Dustin was watching out of one of the side windows and he thought that he saw uh, like what appeared to be like a big black dog. As they got closer, he realized that it was more like a wolf. It was a big black wolf running alongside of the van. And then it ran into kind of in, in like toward a cornfield, you know, that they were driving through. His friend asked him, hey, did you see that big black wolf? And he turned to him to tell him that he did when they both kind of looked back towards where the wolf was running, which was, you know, supposedly like right alongside the wolf ended up just running into a cornfield. And just kind of, you know, disappeared. So they continued on for about another hour when they all decided that they uh, needed to stop at a rest area. And they were all walking, got out, you know, they're walking toward the building uh, with the restrooms. And Dustin noticed that there was movement and sound coming from this cornfield that was very close to 
the the building, you know, where the restrooms were. He thought that he could hear like, you know, crunching around and um and he said to his friend, "Hey, did you hear that?" And his friend said, "Yeah, he he heard it too." So they decided to go into the corn to check it out. Uh, so they're they're going through trying to find the source of the sound and about 25 feet in, they hear very loud breathing, very, very loud. Off to their left, they could also hear a loud, uh, like a low and a loud warning growl, like when, uh, maybe like when you disturb a dog, you know, when it's eating. And so that scared both of them, obviously, but they kind of just thought their curiosity, I would, I can't believe that these guys are so brave, but their curiosity kind of won out and they decided to walk a little closer to where they were hearing this growl, you know, that locations or, or uh, direction. So they're walking toward it. Suddenly they see the source of the noise and it stands up on its hind legs. And they, and he said, you could hear its bones cracking as it went up, you know, into a bipedal um, position. It was so tall that it stood well over the corn stalks. Its lips were curled back in a snarl and they could see that it had large canine teeth. Well, this was, you know, this was enough for Dustin and, his, and he began running back toward the parking lot. And his friend was right behind him. Now, a few things that I kind of um, pulled out of this, you know, getting into like investigative mode. Obviously, I think that it was two separate animals, right? Because it's doubtful that this same black wolf um, was an hour away. You know, I mean, that's kind of impossible. Do you think? Well, first off, thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. Sure. The whole time as you were speaking, I'm just trying to, in my mind, just picture and start yeah. to put together some of the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. And if it um, was a normal animal, then my answer would be no. But actually, as you were speaking, so the powwow makes me think potentially maybe Skinwalker. Okay. okay. And Ryan yeah. Tremblay, actually a good friend of ours as well. He's we call him the Wendigo guy. He <laughs> really educated me a ton about that. And the majority of the indigenous cultures and the Navajo culture, when they speak of skinwalkers, it mm -hmm. literally always translates to he or she on all fours or being on all fours. So basically, mm -hmm. you take the pelt of the animal you've slayed and now becomes. So mm -hmm. this black wolf, right? Yeah. It is still a wolf because skinwalkers aren't werewolves as such. They're on all fours, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering now if, when people hear the popping, right? So mm -hmm. keep in mind, the skinwalker is taken on this wolf. Well, wolves right. aren't meant to be bipedal, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm mm -hmm. wondering now with the bone cracking, because it's a skinwalker, it's forcing this animal that's not meant to be up on mm. two legs to crack yeah. and pop, but it's obviously not going to cause the animal pain because you are a skinwalker mm -hmm. and you are no longer, this wolf is now you. Yeah. And I'm wondering if this is what's going on sometimes in the situations where people hear the popping, mm -hmm. because like I said, a skinwalker is supposed to be on all fours. And if it's forcing itself up because it's a human and it knows in its head that it can do that, then yes. you hear these bones separating and popping because it's not meant to do that. And yeah. now, even though it was an hour away, I'm wondering potentially if there was a skinwalker in the area, yeah. maybe because of the indigenous stuff that was occurring. And it mm -hmm. could have been on its way to see what was going on or maybe yeah. to participate. And I guess that would be my response. How you feel? Yeah, that's a very good point. I didn't even I wasn't even going that route. I really don't know. And this is why I'm you know presenting it to you, because I really I have no clue. Um, a couple of other thing that I kind of pulled out, though, was that um, so I found out that the powwow season in Wisconsin is the beginning of July. And in fact, this year, the Red Cliff powwow will be held July 5th through the 7th. So. I would like to know how high the corn was at the time, right, in that area. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I grew up in Pennsylvania in a rural area where we, we'd always say like, that the corn should be knee high by the 4th of July. But I don't know if this was a different, you know, t sort of corn that maybe was higher than that. But if, if the corn was only knee high, then the, the height of the animal, even on all fours, that wouldn't have been that substantial. Yes. Um, unless, you know, unless it's crouched down, which is very possible. But even standing up on its hind legs, that wouldn't make the height that dramatic but no. you know but, but like i said this is assuming that the that the corn is knee high and i didn't i didn't ask him you know any of these questions and th then i look back in july of 1998 the full moon was on the ninth day of the month and the days around that would have been the moon's illumination at, at no less than 93 percent. so that's a lot you know in the waxing and waning gibbous stages so that's pretty you know, you're gonna have a, quite a bit of ambient light potentially, you know, and, and yeah. And then they also mention about the, the bones cracking bipedally. So that was, that was something that we do hear a lot. So 
I don't know, you know. Very um, interesting for sure. Yeah. And actually, yeah. a lot of people don't realize just in general, even without diving into the curse of the werewolf or the full moon, animals in general act up on the moon. I mean, it's no different than oh, yeah. not for being sure. able to sleep, you know. <laughs> right. So Absolutely. it causes these type of behaviors in general. And back to the thing like I had mentioned about the skinwalker. So if like a lot of us believe here at the North American Dogman Project, including myself, that a lot of these sightings are a living being animal that is an ancestor. Keep in mind, so picture in your head for a second, right? So say if a wolf pops up onto its back legs for a second or a hyena or a baboon or a bear, there's no cracking in the bones. They just do mm-hmm. it. So yeah. yeah, but now if you or like I said, a skinwalker, you're really trying to force yourself up and walk on two legs consistently. There's going to be some bone discomfort and cracking, but to something that's meant to be like that with, with like a yellow baboon that is very comfortable quadrupedally or bipedally, there is no bone cracking and it's very mm-hmm. comfortable in all the motions. So Yeah, right, right. That kind of leads me into um, the trends, you know, in, in commonality, because that was one of them, the bones cracking when they stand up bipedally. Um, another one that was kind of in this that, the, that has been reported by so many people is that dogmen, they claim that they chase the vehicles. They kind of run alongside. And one woman was saying that um, that they were going at least 35 miles an hour and this thing was keeping up for like a dis- sustained distance. And they have, like I said, they've been reported as doing this running bipedally. Now, you know, on all fours, of course, you would think that they're going to be able to, but for it to actually be running on two, you know, on two legs, the average dog's top speed is typically like 20, you know, 30 miles per hour. But again, that's on, you know, on all fours. And I, they say that a great hound can be clocked at like 45, but that's not for a sustained amount of time. So what do you think about about that. I love how you brought that up because I actually have a chart that I was working on. Oh, really? To, um, yeah, just to show people actually how fast animals yeah. can run. And a baboon can run around 30 miles per hour consistently. Wow. A hyena yeah. can go 37 and a gray wolf can go around 40. So, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you so go. a lot of times, mm-hmm. I think, again, people, we just underestimate how capable mm-hmm. predators are. So let's say a cave hyena is running beside your car. Yeah, Mm -hmm. until you start picking up some speed. That hyena Mm -hmm. is meant to go 37 miles per hour. People don't realize we all think that the lion is the dominant predator in Africa. That is incorrect. The actual spotted hyena is the most successful predator in Africa. And they are very capable of running distances and hunting down their prey. Other variations of hyenas are scavengers, but not the spotted hyena. They will, but they like to eat. They like to take down the hogs and Mm. big beasts and go get them. Wolves do the same thing. Coyotes do the same thing. Now, if you start to look at like, you know, mountain lions and grizzly bears, they're not really meant to sustain that speed for a massive amount of time. So a grizzly bear is going to sneak up on you, explode at you, and sure, it can hit that speed for a good consistent amount of time. But then it's going to give up if it doesn't get you because Mm -hmm. it needs to conceal that energy because it's big and bulky. But now when you look at like a wolf that's lean, it's meant for that. Come on, let's keep running. I got you all day, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then, well, like I said, the other, one of the other commonalities was bones cracking and popping very loudly. And particularly it's when the creature goes from all fours to the bipedal position, but we kind of just, yeah, we'd already kind of touched on that. Um, another thing is witnesses report the sounds of heavy metal doors closing or what sounds like to some people, like a dumpster lid being slammed down. And there's nothing in the area that would, you know, that would otherwise like produce these sounds. So what do you think uh, could be the source of that? And have you heard any of that? Any of those reports? So that's a very good question as well. And actually, before I answer that, I want to bring a little bit more merit. So I got hurt okay. playing semi-pro soccer a bunch. And I'm, for, like, I'm doing so much better now. But I have had to see a ton of sports doctors, chiropractors, etc. Okay, so mm-hmm. when my body was out of place and is out of place, like my lower mm-hmm. back, my sacrum, etc. Mm-hmm. I need to be put back into place. I can do that now myself with my foam roller and my medicine balls, etc. But there's mm-hmm. a big 
pop. Okay. There's uh-huh. a big discomfort for a second of, again, you're forcing your body into that. Yes, the position it should be because it's out of position, but it's the mm-hmm. same theory as if you're forcing your body now into a position it's not meant to be, there's going to be bone popping to force it into an unwelcomed position or to force myself back into position. So mm-hmm. when like my SI and my sacrum were completely locked up, it was like there was a board in my lower back and I had to lay on this table where people be the press on it and slam it down. And I had to do this for a very long time until my body finally accepted that, Hey, this is the way you're supposed to be. But every time there was a very loud cracking oh, wow. as it, it was forced back into place. Mm-hmm. So again, I was just thinking a little bit more merit to what we had just been speaking about. That is, if it is a skinwalker that's forcing this animal out of its unknown range of motion, there's going to be yes. a bone crunching and discomfort or mm-hmm. that crunching type noise. And yeah. yes, so I've heard some of those reports, like you were saying too, with some of the sounds of the metal and whistling. And before I answer that, I do know there are scientific explanations for some of those sounds where people have heard that over type of cities and where there's that metal grinding sound. It has something to do with like the echoing of the tectonic plates moving and how sound inverts differently as it hits different spots. It's kind of like when you're in a canyon and you yell, hello, hello, and it yes, comes back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yes, I do actually think that now because the alpha <laughs> since world war one and two been okay. playing around with you know splicing we know stalin was trying to and we know hitler was very infamous for that and we still know modern science unfortunately is doing things like that and yes now sure i could see that if something was if we had done some experiments on that and they were test subjects or now part of our project yeah, they've, they're obviously going to be held somewhere. Oh, so now gorgeous. with the sound of a door opening, sure, there's plenty of bases that we do not know about that are in places in plain sight. Sure, that could be a door opening and releasing your animal mm. off a chain or, or your test yeah. subject. Good and point. I've also heard some, yeah, some hunters report that they've heard like basically the sound of like a dog whistle. This thing would then pull back and go and see what was going on. So this ties into, like I Mm -hmm. said, the original versions of these were not experimented on by the boys, okay? But now Mm -hmm. that we're in this time and era of bringing back creatures and trying to do all kinds of things, yes, of course we've messed around with some things Mm -hmm. like that. And now this is why you could potentially have some different variations because if you took like say a ancient baboon species that you were able to find enough blood and living cells to then combine it with say a yellow baboon you're going to get something pretty interesting in the creational aspect and i know around 10 or 11 years ago with the t-rex they found some bones that had some like soft tissue still inside and blood vessels etc but still at the end of the day with science you still need something that is compatible okay which is why when stalin tried to mate the human and the the chimpanzees or the primates it didn't work Mm -hmm. out in regards of because you're trying to inseminate a female with a chimp's dna it's closely related to us but it's not but now but not enough Mm -hmm. yes but when you take an elephant and a woolly mammoth their dna is almost identical okay so now Mm -hmm. when you raise that inside the fetus inside of that elephant the modern elephant it's not going to be exactly how that woolly mammoth Mm -hmm. was but it's still going to grow like that okay yeah yeah meant to meant to be like that but if you can't no matter what it's impossible to mix a canine and a baboon, et cetera. Okay. And like with hyenas, they're not canine felines. They're related to mongoose, civets, weasels. So you cannot take a hyena and mate it with a dog or splice that. It it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. It's not capable of being interbred like that. Yet now, if you look at you know, people want to speak about like the cynocephali and such. That's an ancient race of people. That's a little bit different than a cave hyena, a short-faced bear, a dinopithecus. That still falls under the triangle of the dogman research, yes. But that also, according to Alexander the Great and Herodotus, was a living, breathing being that was a hellacious fighter on your side or against mm-hmm. you, but it could still be 
Okay, mm-hmm. so if something lives or breathes, cave hyena, cynocephali, short faced bear, dinopithecus, it doesn't matter. It could still live or die. Mm-hmm. Whereas with the whistles and such, I believe now they've, like I said, experimented on things, meaning yeah. you can take, yeah, if it's primate and primate, sure, you can mess around with different types of primates, but you can't take a gorilla's DNA and mix it in with a gray wolf and, and there's nothing that's going to happen out of that. If it were, yeah, right, right. It, evolution would have already done something like that. But when you take a polar bear mm-hmm. or a grizzly bear and they mate, like some of these mm-hmm. new species, yeah. it's still a bear. It's, mm-hmm. it's still capable of mating. It's like now I believe they said something like 60% of coyotes in the United States have a wolf a DNA and yeah. blood and also domesticated yeah. dog. Right. They, they could, yes. Because they mm-hmm. can mate. Okay. Just mm-hmm. because it's a greyhound and a coyote, it's still canine. A wolf mm-hmm. and it's still canine. So yes, right. they could mate with each other. But mm-hmm. you can't take something, you can't mate a yellow baboon with a bear. It doesn't work mm-hmm. like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Makes sense. Yeah. Um so another thing I've had reports of uh well, uh, you know, aggressive behavior such as snarling, growling, um, repeated snapping of the jaws when in terms of when they're they almost like they're like flanking the witness, you know, so you're being followed through the woods um, or wherever, you know, they are for a short distance or for a long time. Um, and suddenly, you know, and, and the witnesses are like they're terrified that they're going to be attacked. Like, when is this going to happen? Obviously, the dog man or whatever it is, is close enough that it couldn't, you know, get them at any time. But they're get, you know, but the, but the witnesses are able to get away. And it's like all of a sudden the pursuit of the creature just stops. And, um, you know, it's kind of it stuns the, the witnesses like, wow, what you know, what happened? Do you think that this is maybe a like a means to just to be to get the, the witnesses out of the area or would this be indicative of some other type of behavior? Yeah, it's um, like, like with bears when they bluff mm-hmm, charge you and tigers, mm-hmm. et cetera. Like, uh, yes, they're ticked off. Get out of my area. I'm going to mm-hmm. snap my jaws at you. Uh, baboons yeah. do that. Make these crazy mm-hmm. noises, bang yeah. their teeth together, chatter uh-huh. out of my area. Doesn't <laughs> yeah. mean they're necessarily hungry at that point in time. I mean, and if they were, then they're going to attack you because they have yes. no problem doing that. But a right. lot of times, right. get out of my space. So, yeah, yeah it's, you, during the day, you can see that a little bit more because, you know, humans are meant to see during the day. But if it's at nighttime and something like a large bear doesn't want you in its territory, but it's not trying to necessarily attack a large group of people. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be slamming things around, chattering its teeth, making crazy noises. I mean, like, I'll give you an example. People don't realize really how ticked off animals can be. There were some stray cats I used to hang around here until we were able to find them homes. Well, some of the younger ones, like the younger females, et cetera, were super aggressive towards like the other like uh, elderly females. When I would be trying to put food out there, she'd run up and literally attack my hand oh, to get wow. it. Wow. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just like oh, get out gosh. of this is my area. And yeah. then same thing with like um, my pet squirrels, some of the other squirrels that come over, they'll all be eating their nuts. And they, they're they cool with each other, but they chase each other around and you hear the teeth chattering like, no, 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 this is my, yeah, yeah. Pe- this, these are my <laughs> peanuts, get out of here. And yeah. so, but same thing, they're not trying to attack yeah. you or necessarily the other, they will, but they're like, get out of my area. So mm-hmm. it's, I think that has a lot to do sometimes where people are hearing that at night because not always are predators going to go after you. Sometimes there's, like I said, bluff charges and just yeah. get away from me. You know, yeah, that I happens mean, a lot in the, in the, yeah, obviously, you know, in Bigfoot research that happens a lot with people. Yeah. Think of a dog, a pet dog. I mean, most dogs mm-hmm. you'd like to think, but say if someone's dog, you don't really know, and it doesn't want you to pet it, what's it? Mm-hmm. get away from yeah. me. Like I didn't uh-huh. say you could pet me. <laughs> you yeah. Know what I mean? yeah. Like, right. Right. Or like yep. Snap its teeth or something. Yes. So, uh-huh. Yeah, that, I guess that would be my response. Yeah, that's I. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I you know along the lines of what I thought too. And I, but um, yeah. So that's good to know. Now this is a new thing, and maybe not to you, but it's it's a new you know kind of commonality that has developed in um, you know, with speaking with people, and it's just been recently, and like I've heard this like maybe three or four times just within the last week. So what they say is witnesses in that they're in areas kind of known for dogmen or other you know cryptic. Uh, cryptid activity, they report seeing teams of military-like individuals dressed in riot or SWAT type of gear. They're carrying high-powered weapons, which are, you know, the much stronger caliber than would be needed to take down humans or or, or even most other predators.
years. And some of these teams have been reported as having canine units with them. Have you heard of any of these reports and what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I've heard of about a ton of those. And that's actually (laughs) super cool you brought that up because our geologist, William White, and I were actually speaking about this the other day. Mm. A lot of people don't realize the average hunter, the caliber of weapon they have is junk. And Mm -hmm. it's meant to take down like a deer, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while every once in a while a massive predator might just drop with a lucky shot but you know how many mm-hmm. times i've seen people unload like six seven eight nine different shots on a grizzly bear because they don't have the right caliber yeah and when you Ugh. go to yeah places like mm-hmm. africa you're not even allowed to go out there unless you have certain specs with the caliber of your ammo because uh-huh. you need to be able to drop what it is you're going at okay right so mm-hmm. yeah it would only make sense i mean if you're out there in the forest and you're, say, hunting grizzly bears or such or a massive predator that can take you out, of course, you're going to want to have a weapon that's going to do something correct. And mm-hmm. I always used to kind of crack jokes at that saying if I ever was to put myself in a situation like that where I was just hiking in the wilderness, not even looking for a cryptid or anything, I would have some nice, like, high-spec military weapon with me. Where I wouldn't yeah. just be rocking <laughs> a rifle that I had to yeah. consistently reload. Mm-hmm. So when people are out there like that as well and are seeing that people also need to realize that in the past there is documented cases of feral people issues around in the Mm -hmm. 1840s where these kind of hit squads were set out for those as well so yeah of course the boys are going to be aware of this and Mm -hmm. if people are going missing in these areas which they are they're Mm going to send out people to try to figure out what's going on as well and they're going to try to be as discreet as possible no different than if you're going on a secret mission in another country you don't just Mm -hmm. completely enunciate yourself right 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 you you try to go in at night as discreet as possible so same Mm -hmm. thing if they're going to go through and clean up some of the feral people problem clean up some of these dire wolves that might still be around these dog men, i don't know Saturday, whatever people would like to look into yes, well of course they're gonna yeah be. or possibly like what you were saying like are they creating these things and weaponizing them and then they get out of control and now oh now we have to go back in and take it down you know we got to get rid of it i i don't know you know it's just a Uh, kind of a thought that all makes logical sense and i think that's potentially what's going on because there's a lot of stuff i mean revenue is what runs the world and then when you look at camping and the forestry service and fishing and all this stuff it makes money so at the end of the day there's a lot of political aspects which would come into play unfortunately meaning if there's an unknown species Mm -hmm. now you have to look at protecting it which means you can't log in these areas etc which would then affect revenue for certain parts and then now if you want people to come to your campground are you going to be like hey come down to the infamous (laughs) lbl where the family of four was massacred in the late 80s your family is gonna love the terrifying Mm -hmm. howls at night i mean yeah that's that's not a really good marketing technique right right yeah people to come to national parks and go hiking you're gonna want to (laughs) as much as possible probably not tell everybody hey we can't really figure out where these people are going and there's unknown animal type behavior mm-hmm. but hey have a good day people aren't right gonna be able to handle that yes for sure yeah exactly definitely <laughs> but so that's all that i have so <laughs> what else do you want to talk about or tell me about no, that's perfect i mean we only have a few more minutes left anyhow so that i'm okay. very glad i was able to try to I mean, keep in mind to my audience and also to yourself, I always encourage everybody, make sure to make your own decisions and go out and, you know, do your own research and never take anybody's word at value without doing your own research and just fact checking things. I mean, that's how I've learned a ton myself. And yeah, when people tell me things, I take that at value, but I also do my own research. And yeah, a, a lot of times things that people have educated me about are spot on, but other times there's just some details that might've been left out, which isn't that individual's fault, but just meaning, hey, there's more stuff to learn. So mm-hmm. I do encourage everyone that if you want to learn more about baboons or some of the specs that Barb and I were talking about with how fast or how long animals can run for, it's all out there. I mean, just do make sure that you read credible sources because that is one thing that's unfortunate with the internet is there's a ton of crap out there too. But, you know, hey, just use your imagination and your discretion and it's all out there. So I encourage everyone to, like I said, make sure to ask questions, do your own research. And if anything is 
something that needs to be corrected, well, this is something that I very much welcome. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Well, I do, like I said, always appreciate getting you on here and uh, talking to you. And I do look forward to more of what's going on and with you and your research and getting you back on here. And like I said, I have a ton of stuff that I've been working on just hypothesis wise. And some of the theories are coming out now and some of the other people are on board. So I've just been really trying to flatten those out and just make sure that when I do get an opportunity to present what it is that I'm doing, that I have what's that term? All my ducks in line. I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use, ducks in a row or whatever. Using, <laughs> yeah. Using uh, puns like that. Right, right. But it's true. Yeah. So I just really got to make sure that my yeah. presentation and what I'm doing is is presented well. And again, I encourage people, it's okay to ask tough questions and it's okay to be a healthy skeptic and it's okay to ask healthy skeptical questions. And if people don't ask people tough questions and such, answers aren't found. It's no different than when dinosaur species, et cetera, are found, paleontologists have to be asked tough questions. Why do you think this species had feathers? Why do you think it didn't? Why do you think it was a predator? It's okay. Like that's how science works. And I welcome all that stuff. I don't get offended. And like I said, I'm a journalist and historian and I am not a scientist nor a biologist. Okay. I observe and I learn from people around me that do specialize in that. And when people want to learn from the scientific aspects, I defer to those people and I let my team speak, which then can solidify things that I've mentioned myself. But again, now you actually have professionals that will sit there and actually verify things. And now it's not just my aspect of saying something. It actually has right. a stamp to it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's great. I think it's a great way to, to go about it. We, we talked you know, you know, before about how this has been done, this was done in the Bigfoot community. And so I think it's great that you, that you are doing this, you know, you're going to prove that what's, what's going on, that that there's something, you know, right. There's something that's going on. You're going to try to prove that. Thank you for everyone who stopped by tonight for another episode of Star Fox Radio and Midnight Lycanthropy. If you did enjoy this episode, please like, subscribe, and share it. Feed the algorithm. And until the next one, stay safe out there.